reason I did Scarface, or how it came to my attention, is I was watching the, the old Paul Muni film uh, about 3 o'clock one morning when I couldn't sleep, or one evening when I couldn't sleep, and it occurred to me that a film like that, a film like Scarface, the rise and fall of an American gangster, uh, had not been done, certainly not been done recently. Had been done since Scarface. That old stop me. I am. I'm giving you orders for the last time. There's only one thing that gets orders and gets orders. And this is it. I'm gonna write my name all over this town with it in big letters. Hey, stop him, somebody. Get out of my way, Jenny. I'm gonna spit. <laughs> Having had done a number of films with Pacino, I'd always wanted to do a large gangster film where he would have a part to play in this genre. And it occurred to me that this was uh, not the old Scarface, because the old Scarface had to do with prohibition, but the rise and fall of a gangster, an American gangster, a dynasty. I talked to Al about it, and I said, you know, there's something here. I don't know where it is yet. I had heard about Scarface for a long time because I, I was working on a play by Bertolt Brecht called Arturo Ui, which was very influenced by the uh, American gangster picture. And I heard, even as a kid, I remember my, uh, my relatives talking about uh, the Scarface and how George Raft flips the half a dollar. And, and so I had heard a lot about it and never saw the picture. So I was one day walking uh, along uh, Sunset Boulevard, of all places, and there was the, uh, I believe it's the Tiffany Theater now, and it was playing in a double bill with something else, I forget, it was Scarface, and there was a few of us. So I said, well, why don't we just go and take a look at it? And uh, we went in, and it was, uh, you know, an astounding movie, astounding. And the performance of uh, Paul Muniz was, uh, was astounding and inspiring. And I thought after that, uh, that I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to imitate him. I wanted to do something. I was inspired by that performance. And I called Marty Bregman, who then uh, put together some people, and uh, they started working on developing this as a, as a film. We started to work on Scarface with David Rabe. Uh, that was the first screenwriter on it. And David and I were working on it, and the screenplay was not exactly uh, going like everybody wanted it to. It was, and, uh, and ultimately, I felt that we couldn't all agree on what we were trying to do. And uh, David and I left the project. And I started to talk to other people. And one of the, one of the people I talked to was Sidney Lumet. Sidney Lumet had the idea of putting it in Cuba which I thought was a, was a brilliant idea. For years, I remember even Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro had the Scarface uh, movie in their, in their repertoire of things they wanted to do. And it was a difficult thing to break through and find the, um, a way in to do it in today's world. He says, well, why don't you do this about the cocaine world? And it occurred to me that that's, that's it. That's it. And I enlisted Oliver, Oliver who I'd known for a long, long time. I were very good friends, and uh, we embarked on this venture, this quest to explore the cocaine world. He came to me after my, the failure of my picture I directed called The Hand, and uh, wanted my services back as a writer. And I needed money, and I was in a tough place. Uh, I was leaving America, and he said he wanted to do Scarface. I said, I'm not really interested in remakes, you know. It was not until uh, Sidney Lamette came into the picture, I think shortly thereafter, we had another conversation, and he told me that Sidney Lamette was very anxious to do the movie and uh, wanted to do it Cuban, uh, Miami, 1980, 81, the Marielle boat lift to Miami. I started into the uh, research into Miami. Uh, I went to uh, Miami extensively, and uh, I got to know both sides. I got to know the, uh, the law enforcement side, the attorney general's, the attorney's office, the uh, gangster elements through the lawyers, the ex-gangster elements, and, the, and then eventually I wanted more, and I plunged on into the uh, Caribbean. I went down to Bimini. On another trip, a separate trip, I went to Ecuador and to uh, Bolivia. I, I, my wife was with me because she was sort of like part of my security. 
a man with a woman that seems a little s less uh, sinister or less intrusive than, than a single man. Naturally, we struck up conversations with a lot of guys with jewelry, kind of playboy types. And I told them I was a screenwriter and I was doing a movie about this stuff, and they were flattered. We started talking and uh, went back to their place, drinking, snorting, having a party. And I mentioned the name of somebody who had helped me in Miami with my research. This person had been a uh, defense attorney. When I mentioned the name, their faces went white. It meant that I may have been in some way connected to the prosecution or to a cop or an enforcement officer, and I was just pretending to be a screenwriter, and I was going underground here. I knew I was in trouble. It was a scary moment, and it was good for me to get back in touch with that fear that I had felt so often in Vietnam, because that fear is sort of what the essence of Scarface is about. If you can capture those moments of fear, uh, the concept of you don't know what's going to happen next, the, the violence can come at any time. And I wrote Scarface in Paris, actually. It got me away from uh, that world of cocaine, because I was doing cocaine myself, and uh, it was uh, interfering with my thought process, and my brain cells were being damaged, you know? So I really needed to get away from America, because I knew too many people here who were doing coke. It was a time of cocaine and excess. You do too much of that shit, you know? Nothing exceeds like excess. You should know that. I just got the script, and uh, on the first reading of the script, I, I realized how Oliver had captured that world and uh, made it his own and, and, and brought out that uh, the wonderful uh, texture and nuance and, uh, and power. When Sidney read the screenplay, he didn't quite like it. He felt it should take more of a political direction, and I thought that didn't, not only wouldn't work, it wasn't true. He thought it was too violent and uh, over the top and didn't, wasn't what he wanted to do. So he left the project, which was disappointing. And uh, obviously I would have loved to have directed. I had directed The Hand and Seizure, but it was a big film with Pacino and they would not let me direct it. I went out and looked for another director and ultimately found De Palma, who saw the film uh, as I saw it, as Oliver had written it. When I first started with David Ray, we had more or less tried to start with the original Scarface Italian Chicago. The script that came to me ultimately that Bregman had developed with Stone was completely different. Nothing I had ever envisioned and that's why I liked it so much because it was a whole new way of approaching this material and those elements were in the original script. I liked the material specifically because to me, it was sort of like a modern metaphor for the treasure of Sierra Madre, where cocaine becomes gold, and, uh, and it's a kind of the American dream gone crazy, where you have this product that you can turn into millions of dollars, but in the process, you destroy your life. Um, and it's sort of like the capitalist dream gone bizarre and berserk and as crazy as it can get and completely self-destructive. I think the direction that, that we chose was pretty much embodied in the original Scarface, the elements that were basic in the construction of the Muni Scarface. I like Johnny, but I like you more. I like Frank, you know? Only I like you better. It was the sister, the mother, the Manola, the Manny character, okay? His love affair with the, his competitor's girlfriend. I mean, all of these things were in the original Scarface. And Oliver, being the brilliant writer that he is, invented the rest of it. Bregman made some very, very important and very helpful suggestions. Pacino had some good ideas. Brian De Palma came onto the project and uh, was very supportive. And uh, when we came to shoot the film, he allowed me to um, take part in the film, be there, and, and study it. You know, Al is very much interested in the material and how the character is developed and how it's plotted out. And, and Oliver, of course, has very strong opinions. And it was a kind of lively collaboration, as I recall. All I have in this world is my balls and my word. And I don't break them for no one. Do you understand? Do you want to go on with me? Do say it. Do you don't? Then you make a move.
going to give me the cash? Or do I kill your brother first? Before I kill you. Why don't you try sticking your head up your ass? See if it fits. I would say the most defining experience about Scarface was my first opportunity to work with a truly great actor. Working with Al, he's like a, you know, incredible talent. All of the films that I have made with Al, I have created for him, specifically for him, specifically for the things that I thought he could do best playing. I have a long and an old relationship with, with Pacino. I represented him when he first started. So I have a, a great knowledge of his instrument which helped me in Scarface and the other films I made with him. I'm Tony Montana, a political prisoner from Cuba. And I want my fucking human right now. I felt that this Scarface was a piece of so many different kinds of gangsters we've seen. He was representative of, um, of a collective uh, person. He wasn't um, organized so much. He seemed almost like a, a renegade in all of this. Uh, even though he would comply, you knew eventually that he couldn't stick to any uh, format, any controlled environment. He was out of control, which was an attractive thing in his character to play. Who put this thing together? Me. That's who. Who do I trust? Me. But it was a long, arduous casting process. Stephen was somebody that we saw right in the beginning and liked right in the beginning. I was born in Cuba in uh, 56. Um, actually, I was born the day that, that Fidel Castro arrived from Mexico, you know, ready to start the revolution. My dad, uh, at a certain point, decided that things were not going to get any better. So he gathered us together and he took us to the airport. My little brother, myself, and my mom, it's 1960. They got off the ground and once they were in airspace, in the uh, international airspace, uh, he said, uh, I'm not going back. I'm out, I'm gone. So he arrived in Miami, he had a dime in his pocket. We lived from house to house, from different people's houses in the first few months, and uh, did the whole uh, exile experience. We're gonna be out of this place in 30 days. Not only that, but we got a green card and a job in Miami, man. Now what we made, or oh, are we made, man? Over the years, I grew up to be an American. I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like the kids in my school who didn't have Spanish surnames got through high school, went to Europe, saw Europe, and uh, came home and I said, I've got to do something. I went to junior college just to kind of kill time and then uh, and I walked into an audition for, for a play, for a Tennessee Williams play, and I got cast. And once I was in the process, in the rehearsal process, I said, this is it, this is what I do. I was living in Manhattan and studying with Stella Adler and going through that whole uh, journey uh, of uh, the starving actor. And I got a call about an interview and this woman, uh, she's casting this film. It's called Scarface. It's starring Al Pacino. And the second role is his buddy. So I go, and she says, oh my god, they're right. You're, you're perfect. She goes, I have to call Brian. And she gets on the phone and calls Brian. And, uh, and Brian says, send him over. So I go meet Brian. He says, OK, um, all right, so you speak Spanish, right? Yeah, you're cute. You're really cute. Yeah, I'm Cuban. And he goes, OK, well, he calls Marty Bregman. He says, OK, I'm calling the producer calls Bregman, he goes, yeah, he's right, he's perfect. So I went back to L.A. and I met Marty Bregman. And Bregman, from day one, says to me in his voice, you know, he says, kid, you're going to do this movie. You're going to play Manny. You can't get the part yet because there's a lot of variables, a lot of things. But hang on to this thought. Learn this, be it, and be ready. When the time comes, step in. You're going to do it. Stephen Bauer was chosen to play the second male lead in this. Uh, after he had read for us. His background certainly didn't indicate that he could stand up on screen next to Al because most of the scenes were with Pacino. And if you look at any of Pacino's work, it's very difficult to watch any other actor if he's on the screen. And Stephen, in a reading, convinced us very quickly that he was the right, he was the right person for this. Eventually, uh, we said, okay, you're gonna meet Al. He was in Brian's uh, office and uh, I went over there, and uh, it was love at first sight, though. It was great. Uh, I walked in, and he was there, you know? He was there, and he's, you know, he's just a, he's like a kid, you know? And we just, we hit it off, like, immediately, immediately. It was done deal. It was like we were ready to start to be those guys. Stephen and I became very close friends, 
and uh, we spent uh, much, much time together and just going over uh, our relationship and what it was in the past and we enjoyed it. We had fun doing that, making a kind of a scenario, making up a story and that was um, a lot of the work we did together. I told him what you told me to tell him. I told him, told him you were... I was in sanitation. They didn't go for it. Sanitation? Yeah. I told you to tell him you was in a sanitarium, <laughs> not sanitation. But there was a long process until we ultimately settled on the final cast. You know, we're getting to a point where these decisions had to be made. Al would sort of go back and forth about, well, this is good, but this isn't quite working. And uh, we ultimately had a screen test at the ninth hour uh, and finally decided on Michelle. Tony Montana. Hello. Annie Rivera. Vida. Michelle Pfeiffer was a young actress that nobody had heard of. Michelle Pfeiffer's agent called me and suggested that I meet with her. And I said, well, if she would be good enough to fly herself in, I would see that she would certainly get a reading. And she did. For me, that was very important. I had every intention of paying for her transportation, which we did before we hired her a couple of months later. But if a young actor is that committed or is that interested in doing that role, that they would take the dollars, and they would, which are hard-earned dollars at that point in their careers, and come in or make that kind of an effort. We always pick up the tab. And she did, and we auditioned her with, we, we read her with Al, with a lot of other young ladies. I think we auditioned every young actress in the business at that point. And at the theater that we used as a, as a casting, when she got up on stage, she brought Al to life. Hey, Jose. Who, why, when, and how I fuck is none of your business, okay? Not your talking to me, baby. That I like, okay? Keep it coming, baby. Don't call me baby. I'm not your baby. Uh, not yet, but you gotta give me some time. <laughs> it's interesting because I don't think even he was aware of it, but it happened. The relationship happened there. It was right then and there. Because nobody heard of this girl, and nobody we were interested in maybe casting this role up, but when she was just magic. And that's why, that's why we use it. There was no question in my mind from the moment I saw her read that she was going to do this part. Michelle Pfeiffer was very interesting uh, because it was one of her earlier movies. And I think she was uh, very attentive and committed. And, and she is a very um, uh, involved working person. She's, she's, she's involved all the way. And I think with this picture, I didn't know her. And uh, she seemed uh, like she wanted to uh, discuss a lot of what was going on. And I remember her being very intense and, and interesting. I cut you here again. I'm gonna wipe you all over this fucking place. Oh, Do you yeah. understand, Jack? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Do it now. I wanna see it. I wanna see it now, big Don't shot. push me, baby. No, I wanna Don't see, you see it now. Get, get the fuck out of here. Mary Elizabeth and Antonia was a very wonderful young actress when I first met her. And the, we, we picked her like we picked uh, Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer. We read her, and she was magic and she was the person, she was Gina. Mary Elizabeth, I remember the re rehearsing with her and, and, and going over some, I can even remember talking about what was going on in this relationship because it was a, a strange thing that does take place and I don't think he thought of his sister that way. But he felt a love for her and he felt a purity for her that obviously represented something to him. Uh, he, he endowed her with this kind of innocence and saintliness. It was an odd thing and an interesting thing to have in a movie. It had a certain tragic element to it. She's beautiful. How come you... Hey! Just stay away from her. You hear? She's not for you. We just clicked, you know, she was their favorite and, uh, and I was their favorite and they put us together and we read and, and, and it was just right. The chemistry was right. And uh, she's just as wholesome and as able to turn and be that fire, you know, that spitfire, you know, when she turns on him. You got some nerve, Tony! You think you can come in here now and tell me what to do? Get out of here. You can't tell me what to do, Tony. No more. I am not a baby anymore. I'll do what I want to do. I'll see whoever I want to see. And if I want to fuck him, Tony, then I'll I don't know why all her scenes used to make me like I get all choked up because she was it was so she's so pure, you know. It comes down to one thing, Tony Boy. Huh? 
and you never forget. Lesson number one. Don't underestimate the other guy's greed. <laughs> Robert Lozier was chosen, again, on the basis of a reading. Robert Lozier is a fine actor, and he fit the role, and he did an exemplary job. I thought Robert Lozier seemed to, to, to just embody this guy, and, and uh, he was, I felt very, uh, very daring in his, in, his, in his portrayal. He and F. Murray Abraham, I thought both of them uh, contributed a great deal to the movie. How do you think of him? I think he's a fucking peasant. <laughs> yeah. But you get a guy like that on your side, it breaks his back for you. The group that we surrounded Pacino with in the film were all Cuban, basically all Cuban. Anytime that there was a problem in the accent, in Al's accent, they had the right to interfere and suggest that this, that he was off with it. You a communist? Huh? How do you like it? They tell you all the time what to do, what to think, what to feel. Robert Easton was a tremendous help to me with the dialect and also the um, Cuban people who I met and spoke with, who gave me a lot of uh, insights into some of the uh, mannerisms and stuff, all of which I tried to put into a capsule and swallow and see what would come out. And I was trying more not to be as authentic because I don't believe you can really be authentic unless you can mimic very well. But if I could take the accent and the mannerisms and, and sort of just heighten them in a way for this, uh, for this approach to this movie, because I think Brian De Palma was going to take a, a larger-than-life approach to this film to uh, conceptually deal with the movie in a more operatic style, just slightly larger than life. And so I think that was uh, incorporated into my interpretation. Al did a lot of the interesting things. When I first met him, we were doing some screen tests. We were testing Michelle Pfeiffer and other ladies. And then um, after we finished that day, he said, Johnny, can I ask you a big favor? I said, yeah. He said, only speak Spanish to me once we start the movie. I said, really? Why? He said, I, I want to hear Spanish. And he said, maybe I don't understand, but just talk to me in Spanish. So I did. For the entire picture, Al Pacino and John Alonzo spoke Spanish. He was a Spanish himself, so when I was off with an accent, I asked John if he would help me. And I love that he spoke to me in Spanish. That's part of his preparation, and I think that's part of uh, what makes him one of America's finest actors. We had a month of rehearsal time. This is unheard of, you know, but Bregman insisted on it, and Brian insisted on it, and we rehearsed that thing. So we could have taken it on the road like a play. Scene, 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 bang, bang, bang. We had a great cast, you know, these great actors. And Brian was great, his graciousness and his generosity and, his, and the wisdom, really, that it took to allow what he allowed, allow for exploration and spontaneity when there was room for it. It was a whole ensemble piece and uh, a lot of playing the scenes back and forth and uh, Al and the other actors would find, you know, they would improvise things and find things to uh, build into the scenes and Oliver would come back and rewrite them. There was a lot of that. I felt good when he was involved because first of all, he responded to the script in such a passionate and positive way. And this idea he had of making this thing larger than life, a little bit more uh, heightened a reality, appealed to me. Say hello to my little friend! And I know every actor I've ever met does Tony Montana. This country, you gotta make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. You know, whether it's Bruce Willis, who does an incredible Tony Montana, or Tom Cruise, who does an incredible Tony Montana, or Alec Baldwin. I mean, you know, they all do him. I mean, it's like, you know, we used to do Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront. You know, it's such a audacious character with such wonderful lines. You know, and Al did such an incredible performance that, you know, every actor in the world loves to play that part. So say good night to the bad guy. Come on. The last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you.
Originally, we were going to shoot the entire film in Miami because that's where the story takes place. We scouted locations in Florida, and we were going to shoot the movie in Florida, but then the Cuban community became so outraged at how we were representing them, they basically ran us out of town. There was an element of the Cuban community that were convinced that this was a Castro-financed uh, film, which was obviously not true. I mean, Castro had nothing to do with this film. We were doing a gangster film. We were doing a theatrical film, an operatic theatrical film. Uh, but there were some, some people that, uh, within the Cuban community, a small part of them, that were convinced that we were out to, in fact, hurt their reputation collectively. There were a number of threats made, uh, and we thought that it would be best if we moved the production from Miami to California. We shot it in L.A., we shot it in Santa Barbara, we shot it in New York, and then we went to Florida for, for about, I'd say, we shot two weeks there. And when we went back in, we had all kinds of bodyguards, but we were originally going to shoot the whole movie there. Como se llama? Antonio Montana. And you? What you call your son? Uh, Tony Montana, who was named, by the way, after my star at that time was Joe Montana, because I was a big 49er fan, and I was looking around for a good name. I thought Montana, the mountain, Montana. I think the most stunning thing about Al is his face. He's the kind of guy that can hold the screen with his face. When you start a movie, you sort of want to give the lead character a very impressive entrance. And that face, that character, the crazy shirt he's wearing, the scar, the way he moves, the way he talks. Uh, you just want to really hit them because you're hitting them with something they've never seen before. A lot of this had been reported on the news, but nobody had ever seen in a movie before. And to see these Cuban gangsters and the way they talked, the way they moved, and he just sort of embodied that in that close-up. It's a very well-written scene by Oliver. I think Brian's ideas on the opening of Scarface uh, were very interesting to me, and it was very, again, against the grain, so to speak. Instead of using these a big wide crane shot or something to introduce the, the character. Uh, he introduces him in a close-up, sitting in a chair, and he had the camera roll around him, 360 degrees, all the way around him. He did the performance to take about maybe five, six takes like that. And they were all close, they were all close, and I thought, what a fascinating thing. In other words, he was introducing that face to the audience. And, in, and the script is so good, you also felt the personality coming out of him. You know, that, uh, that arrogant behavior, that Latin machismo coming out of this, this man with a scar on his face. Where'd you get the beauty scar, tough guy? Eating pussy? How am I gonna get a scar like that eating pussy? I was very worried that it looked phony, it was too big, it was too small, so we did many makeup tests until we came up with something we all sort of liked. So I felt this character was good with a knife and had, had fought with a knife, and the scar really came from one of those fights, and I thought it would be interesting if it got to the eyebrow, and, and the action pulled my head away, and it went down even further into this part of the face. So there's one up here and here. I like the different places because I think it, it was evocative of a chaotic uh, wildness in this guy, that he was all over the place. He had one here and one there, you know. I think Brian has an affinity for doing the, the high crane shots, the straight down shots, the bird's eye view of things. And, and some of the things in Scarface were born out of necessity. For instance, the opening uh, in, internment camp that was uh, under the freeways and so on. Uh, if we had been leveled off, you would have seen that it was Los Angeles and not Miami. And uh, Also, he was giving you that sort of introduction as if you're coming from heaven just to come down and to take a look at these people that are interned. He likes to move the camera a lot, and um, but he doesn't do it arbitrarily. I don't think he does it just uh, what I call cinematic gymnastics. He does camera moves that are an integral part of the story. Other than the personal events, uh, the wars, the actual drug wars, uh, the actual massacres, the chainsaw massacre, were all based on real incidents, very much so. We. We got a big assist from the U.S. Attorney's Office down there. And they showed us their files, and they showed us their tapes, their videotapes of, of, of crime scenes. All of the violence in this film that didn't happen, happened. 
They didn't just kill each other in these drug wars. They literally chopped people up and found them sawed up in a trash can outside a 7-Eleven. So I wanted to establish a level of violence that nobody had ever seen before, because this is a whole different level of mob interaction, uh, not the sort of pleasant shootouts of this godfather or stranglings or people being stabbed in the hand. Uh, now we're into really terrible ways of killing each other. And, and I wanted to get it over early in the movie to set up, say, this is, this is what it is. We're in a whole different world here. The chainsaw scene was based on an event I heard about because I hung out with Miami County of Miami and Dade County, and I also hung out with uh, Fort Lauderdale, which had another whole history. So I hung out with three different departments, and the case histories were pretty thick on, the, on murders. Definitely, the saw had been used. The scene was basically written by Oliver, and I just had to figure out a way of doing it, which, uh, you know, wouldn't turn into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That is a uh, vintage uh, De Palma technique. And you can feel it when you're doing it that uh, he set things up in such a way with such a strong um, visual understanding of what he wanted to do with that and how he wanted to build it. So I just, uh, I just marvel at it. And I, I was in the scene and I felt as though uh, it was so laid out and so completely mapped out that it, it, uh, it wasn't difficult to do. They never, you never see it. You see it off of Puccino's face. You see it off of reactions, but you never see it. I said, that to me is good directing because uh, to leave you with the taste that you've seen something that actually hasn't happened. Well, it was interesting. When Scarface first came out, the, the scene, the shower scene, uh, was picked on by almost every major reviewer in this country uh, as something that was extremely violent, that was, that was disgusting. But if you take a look at that scene very closely, we show nothing. All it is is sound. sound and a man's face and blood but there's nothing that goes on in that scene you saw nothing it was it was something that permeated the audience's imagination which was brilliant filmmaking really it was it was uh, I mean that's probably one of the, the most interesting that Brian ever did when you do a scene like that there are props around that you use or don't use and though we may have had body parts to be hanging if we shot them we never used them or we didn't shoot them but the intention was always uh, suggest what was happening. You could hear it. You, you didn't have to see it. You want to set up the world these guys are in. And once you set up a, a terrifically violent scene early in a movie, you don't really have to do much more after that. I expected Brian to give us his elaborate details of how he wanted the picture to look and what he wanted to work with. And all he said is, John, I want you to give me the most beautiful pictures, and I'm going to put violence inside. The movie was supposed to be shocking. <laughs> it's a sh shocking world, and, uh, and these are like gangsters you've never seen before. Well, it was shot in a, you know, a couple of parts. We hung F. Murray from a crane, basically. But the stuntman, Dick Zyker, had to leap out of the helicopter with a noose around his neck, and it had never been done before. That was a kind of tense day, as I recall. We had a couple of cameras on it, and they, you know, they flew around, and then they literally tossed him out of the plane. And then we you know, intercut it with you know, Murray hanging from a crane. I want to do a kind of uh, high-tech, neon, acrylic, vibrant pastels instead of your usual dark film noir, because you looked at South Florida and this is what it was all about. These guys dressed in white, not black. And Scarfiati came up with a whole great look for the movie, and he was just a genius. Well, the Babylon Club in Scarface, uh, an extraordinary set that Nando Scarfiati designed, and he warned me before I saw the set he didn't warn me as much as asked me, he said, do you mind mirrors? And I said, no, I don't mind mirrors. I figured one or two mirrors here. I walk on there and there's 15 panels of mirrors all the way around. And to add to the dilemma, Brian says, I'd like to shoot two and three cameras. So that made it even funnier because I had to check each camera to make sure the mirrors were not reflecting itself or the other camera. 
and that when it was they were to be destroyed with gunshot, that we weren't going to get an accidental reflection. Stan Parks and Ken Papio are the mechanical effects men. These guys were in charge of the explosions, the pyrotechnics, and all that. They're extremely talented men, and uh, the the fear that I had, everybody had, that these mirrors exploding so close to Puccino that, you know, flying glass and so on, because they couldn't really be plastic, see? Because if they were plastic, they wouldn't break. Uh, they had to be plate glass so that they, they would have the implosion. What they did uh, was very, very clever. They were able to more or less implode them so that they could take the, the, pellet, the pellets away from Puccino's face. And then we go on the set. These sets were like, fuck. You know, we'd read it. We'd been reading it for months, you know, and suddenly there it is, you know. They built these things, you know, at Universal, and the sound stages at Universal. And we'd walk on, it's like, oh, now I know where I am, and like, boom, we were there. Manny, look at this, Pelican fly. Come on, Pelican. The humor was a part of what I thought right from the start would be necessary in order to, to get this guy so that you could uh, laugh at him also, because if not, it was just going to be a you know, one-way street. Playtime is over, OK? <laughs> That's a Carla. It looks like somebody's nightmare. You needed to find those odd things, those twists, those ironies, to give the character some intelligence too you know so that there was a there was something else going on also otherwise it would be too blunt and too hard to take i think what the fuck was that what you just did that's it that's what you do very disgusting watch oh look at that fucking thing that looks like a lizard like a bug coming out of your mouth Oliver said, in the scene, you do this thing, you know, have you ever done that? And I said, do that? And he goes, it's this thing. I saw this guy in Miami do this thing, with, uh, you know, with a tongue. And I, and I said, you, you saw somebody do that? He goes, yeah. And I go, yeah, what? And he probably got slapped. He goes, that's what happens. You get slapped. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, but do it. I mean, like, really do it. Can you do it? And I said, well, I'll practice, you know. And I start doing it, you know, and he goes, oh, you're man, Manny, oh, it's perfect, perfect, perfect. Show Brian, show Brian, you know. You know, if I wasn't a nice guy, I'd come oh, on. Come on, just to pay for you. Come on. Of course, in trouble like that. Come on. Bitch. What I try to tell you? Lesbian. Well, I think it's important to establish that, you know, robbers, they sort of enjoy the money they rob. I mean, you know, they have a good time. The cocaine world is a crazy world. It's not all grim death and murder, I mean, you know, it's fun. The clubs should be fun, the girls should be fun. It's a price to pay for all this, but you gotta show that why they're there. Well, they may be killers, but they're kind of colorful. I thought it should have that, you know, very electric disco sound. That's what they were playing in the clubs. I mean, that's all these people live by. It's a very cocaine sound, you know. Get in one of these places, put down a couple of lines, turn the music up so you can hardly breathe, and party. Tony gets the American dream, but it's hollow because there's nothing going on spiritually. He can't love. He can't love uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. He can't, he can't reach a crawl. He can't connect. I have Nick the pig as a friend. What kind of life is that? What were we to? All he can love is his sister, his blood, but his, his ability to uh, imagine a form of love outside himself is gone by the materialism that surrounds him, is destroyed by it. Al reminded me always of Humphrey Bogart with that kind of narrow face and those kind of uh, nervous eyes of his. And I thought that it'd be a great finale for him to be buried in a mound of gold dust or cocaine, you know, like just crash into it. The cocaine that Al snorted was real. <laughs> no, I don't know what Al was snorting to take the truth. I do remember we tried out baby milk, which is dried milk. But there was nothing easy to snort because it would get in your nose and you'd be blowing his nose all the time. But uh, I never snorted, so I can't really attest to what it was. I don't like to give away that secret because it takes away from somebody's belief 
You have to have a secret. I mean, that's part of what we do. The ending of the, of, of the Paul Muni Scarface has probably a lot to do with the codes of the time that the bad guy had to uh, repent or to, had to crawl on his knees and to beg and be a coward so that he could be killed or punished. So I think that that was probably dictated the ending of Ben Heck's uh, Scarface. I think it was more interesting to let Al Pacino, uh, Tony Montana, destroy himself, uh, to bring himself down, which seemed to be the case if you study uh, the history, the, the, the profiles of the drug lords, you will see a pattern money and excess and wealth. Uh, luxury uh, corrupts far more ruthlessly than war. This here, that's what it's all about, money. The only memory I have of that is putting myself in a kind of trance, trance-like state, because I was in a coked up state as the character. So I found myself every day going into this room with all these guns and all the smoke and all this hell actually and I would put myself in some kind of a, a give myself a kind of mantra and just go in bite the bullet and uh, you know spend the 12 14 hours there every day day in day out uh, just shooting that sequence Shout out to my little friend. once you find that you get into a rhythm and if you're uh, relaxed when you're doing it, you can take anything. You get zen about it. Because uh, if you, for once, take a look around you, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just unendurable. A lot of times when guns are shooting, you don't see the flash. And when you see a gun shoot, you like to see the flash. And so we rigged up something that synchronized the flashing to the shutter of the camera so that you could see the flashing all the time. Ken Papio and, and uh, Stan designed this synchronization system for the weapons so that the camera shutter is open to see the flame and Pacino can't fire it unless the shutter is open. And it sort of drove Pacino crazy a little bit because he pressed the trigger and it wouldn't fire until the camera was perfectly in sync with his flash. And it got a little testy there because he wanted the freedom of it. Uh, but it worked out very good. These men were very, are very talented men. We had a lot of time to shoot there because Al burned himself badly on one of the guns. And so I basically had to shoot like two weeks without Al. So I had a lot of time to shoot the Colombians doing things. I'm trying to think how many cameras we used in Climax. I'm not sure. I think we had, we had one on a crane and we had two down below and a third one. May have been four, maybe four or five cameras that we had. We had, yes, sir, we had a, a slow motion camera that was prepared to shoot the stuntman as he got hit, or Puccino as the squibs were going off. We had one camera in slow motion. We may have had five cameras on that sequence. Steven, a very old friend of mine, came over to the set and thought this was great and said, I got an idea, let's put a camera over here. I said, fantastic. So we stuck a camera, I think it was a low angle camera over on the side and uh, it was used for when uh, the Colombians first come into the uh, house. probably took um, more than half a day just to line up exactly where the cameras were going to go. And it took two days to get the stunt of the man falling. Um, it, it, I say it took two days because it wasn't really working right the first time. And he had to hold his breath too when he landed there because Brian wanted to keep shooting for a long time. I thought it was very important that we dedicate the movie to Howard Hawks and Ben Heck because that was always the inspiration for it. The theme for Tony had to reflect uh, the character and the person of Al Pacino, of course, of the, the character of the movie. And uh, it has to be a little dangerous, a little suspenseful, uh, but a little deep too. 
and uh, I think it reflects quite well that, that atmosphere which uh, was uh, at that time in, in Miami with all the crime and all that stuff. Giorgio Moroda had done a very good score for Paul Schrader uh, and, uh, in, in uh, The American Gigolo. And uh, I liked the sound. And of course, as I went into these clubs where all these guys were hanging out, all they played was this sort of you know, endless disco, coked up music. So that seemed perfect for the score. The theme for the two girls was a little tricky because I wanted to have the same feel for both because Tony is in love with her sister and in love with Elvira. And so the sounds are very similar. The melodies are slightly different, but that was done in purpose so to create a little bit of an ambiguity and, uh, and to show the people that Tony is in love with both. The gentleman that was head of the MPAA at that point uh, had a very strong negative feeling about this film in terms of its violence and in terms of its language. Fuck anything and anyone. Can't fuck and you fuck. stop saying fuck all the time? But the language was a big problem to him, and he threatened us, not only threatened us, but he, he stamped an X rating on this film. We discussed what they thought was bothering them, and then I made an adjustment, and I sent it back to them a second time. They gave us an X again. Then I cut it back a third time, and they were sort of fixated on how many gun hits were in the clown. And I was thinking, the clown? They're worried about the gun hits in the clown. So this is the third time I sent it back, and they still gave us an X. And the studio, of course, was saying, to me, solve this. You know, you know we can't release an X movie. But I wasn't going to cut it anymore. I felt it was against what the material was. I didn't think it was overly violent. I thought it was just showing the world of these people. And I thought it was affecting the dramatic thrust of the movie. So I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I think it's, we're, we're gonna hurt the movie. And then I basically got on the phone and uh, I called some of my reporter friends nobody knew about, and I said, this is an outrage. So there was tremendous amount of articles. And I went to arbitration on this, except I went prepared for literally a court case. I brought in three psychiatrists, three experts in this field. I brought in Time magazine. I brought in the police officer, the head of the organized crime bureau from Miami, in terms of how this would affect children, the fact that it was an anti-drug film and how important it was for it to be made. And we conducted this thing. We conducted this like a trial. And we beat him. We beat him hands down. The vote was 18 to 2 in favor of our getting an R rating. Basically, somebody said, we got to let the world know it's happening. And that's what I think swayed them. And we won. Now, there's something that gets completely confused all the time. Because I cut the picture back three times, everybody assumes they saw the third cut. But I called the head of the studio, and I said, if I have an X on the third version, I have an X on the first version, the initial version. They're all Xs. Why don't I just go with the first version? And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. And I said, why not? <laughs> an X is an X, isn't it? So, so what the version you see in Scarface is the original version that I cut. It's not changed, it has not been cut back, and that's what we fought over, and that's what we won with. When I first saw the movie, I thought that Brian had achieved that operatic uh, style. I thought it would be controversial, though. I thought that there would be a reaction to it that it would affect a certain kind of uh, criticism. But it was the movie Brian set out to make, and I, and I thought he achieved it, and uh, I was pleased. At the first screening, actually, the first screening in New York, Martin Scorsese was sitting in front of me, and I was a nervous wreck. And uh, he turned around in the middle of it, and he said, he said, they're gonna hate this film, but they're gonna love it, too. He said, people are gonna love this. He says, you guys are on. You're right there, you're on, you're dead on. And he says, you're onto something, you know. When I saw the film, I was very proud of it. It was, you know, one of my children. I'd go on the New York subways and I'd hear dialogue from the picture. I knew that it hit a nerve. When Scarface was 
reviewed and released. We did very well business-wise, but review-wise, we did terribly. There wasn't a major reviewer in this country, with the exception of Vincent Camby of the New York Times, who thought this wasn't garbage. Now, these same reviewers have pointed to Scarface as the consummate gangster film, as the landmark gangster film. Tony Montana was a product of his time. He came here not to blow up banks and not to go into the cocaine business, but this is what was available to him. Uh, as many, many uh, poor people that come to the States, there's nothing open for them, especially somebody like Tony Montana who had a bit of a criminal background and he didn't know where to go. So, like many others, he fell within this criminal group. Uh, but he was a heroic figure. He was a man that had integrity. He was a man that climbed very quickly based upon his intelligence and his toughness to become a king of industry, if you will. His industry just happened to be cocaine and was illegal. But he was a dynamic character. He was certainly a, an exciting character. He was a romantic character. He was all the things that a good gangster film should, should be in terms of the leading man. It is one of my, my, my favorite films. I felt that what I started out trying to do with that character, make that character in a way, and this sounds uh, strange, I know, but I picked the two dimensions, not three dimensions for this character. This side and that side. And, uh, and I went with, you know, sort of tried to go with the globe, you know, and, and, and say, this is it, this is what you see. And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't try to go into another area with it. And so I felt, in terms of that, I, I, I might have uh, succeeded then. And I'm you know, very proud of my collaborators. They're all great artists. You know, Oliver, and Al, and Michelle. I mean, you could go down the whole list. And Bregman. I mean, Bregman was a really fine producer and held this sort of group together. Um, so in a sort of traditional Hollywood way, where you have a great producer and a great actor and a great director and a great screenwriter, I think we made a really great movie. Uh, and everybody did the best they could in a very kind of very controversial material. And, uh, and we got our heads handed to us at the time because the movie was, you know, sort of scandalized everybody. But in retrospect, when you look it back, you say, this is really good. Me, I want what's coming to me. Oh, well, what's coming to you, Tony? The world should go. And everything in it.